Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's presentation. My name is Carrie Mokowski, National Program Senior Manager at FAIR, and I will be your moderator um, for today's discussion. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This presentation will be recorded and posted on FAIR's website in about seven to 10 days. Um, please note that for maintaining a quality reporting, uh, everyone joining us today is going to be muted throughout the presentation. However, if you are having any technical difficulties um, or actually if you have any questions throughout the presentation, there is a question box feature in Zoom that you can use. So please feel free to reach out to me through that. Um, lastly, if you happen to be on Twitter, um, we encourage you to join us in conversation there during this broadcast. You can follow along at our handle, at Food Allergy, um, and using the hashtag FAIR webinar. So, without further ado, I'm so delighted to introduce you to this woman you see on your screen, today's presenter, Dr. Kristen Sokol. Dr. Sokol is a, a board-certified allergist, immunologist, and board-certified pediatrician specializing in the care of both adult and pediatric patients with a variety of allergic and immunologic disorders. She was thrilled to join the practice of Schreiber Allergy in the summer of 2019. Prior to this, she was an assistant professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, and at Beth Israel Medical Center in Boston. She then joined the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, where she treated patients and performed research in the field of food allergy and the genetics of allergic disease. Dr. Sokol serves as Secretary of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, Health Outcomes, Education, Delivery, and Quality Interest Section. She was named a Quad AI Choosing Wisely Champion in 2016 for her work with the Choosing Wisely Campaign, bringing awareness to the need for reducing overuse in healthcare. She believes in delivering the highest quality of care while at the same time helping patients choose tests and procedures that are truly necessary. She has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals, has co-authored several book chapters, and has been invited to give talks regarding the diagnosis and management of various allergic and immunologic conditions, including food allergy, allergic rhinitis, asthma, mast cell disorders, and primary immunodeficiency. At this time, I'm so delighted to turn the presentation over to her. Thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you to FAIR for allowing me to speak today about this important topic and to a lot of families and patients with uh, newly diagnosed food allergies. So I'll get started. Um, so what happens now? So your child or yourself has been diagnosed with a food allergy, now what? Just to briefly touch on the fact that this is not your fault a hundred times over and you are not alone. There are so many different reasons um, and causes of food allergy. It's not your fault. Just remember that. So what happens next? So if, you, if your child has been diagnosed with a food allergy, you should have already been hooked up with a board certified allergist to help you kind of navigate and manage this journey. So communication with a physician all along is quite important. Um, shared decision making with your physician, obviously very important. This is not a one-sided diagnosis. You have to have a physician who is able to talk to you and communicate with you through this and um, really you know, come up with a plan that works for your family because not, it's not a one-size-fits-all diagnosis and management for sure. Coming up with a plan, like I just said, knowing your online and offline resources, which I'll touch on at the end of this talk, um, and throughout the talk. And then of course, managing your fear and anxiety over this new diagnosis, and especially during the time of COVID. And we'll touch on this throughout the presentation. So again, you're not alone. 70% of families with kids or adults with food allergy report significant effect on social events. 60% report significant effect on meal prep. 40% report significant increases in stress within and out the home. 34% report a decrease in school attendance or performance, and even 10% of parents with food allergic children tend, um, choose to homeschool their children. 
So back to basics. I know most of you probably know this already, but just let's, let's define it. What is a food allergy? So a food allergy is an overreaction by the immune system to a food protein. So the role of the immune system, or one of the roles of the immune system, is to protect the body from germs and disease. So when a food protein that the immune system has mistaken as a threat is ingested or eaten, the, the immune system thinks that food protein is harmful and starts releasing a lot of chemical mediators, including histamine and others, to attack that enemy or food protein. Importantly, we have to note that food allergy reactions occur every time that food is ingested, are reproducible over time, and happen quickly. So this is in contrast to food intolerance. So this is a quite important distinction. Food intolerance does not involve the immune system and is not life-threatening. You would also hear of this in the media or maybe friends talking or on blog posts. It's also known as food sensitivity. This usually takes place in the GI system or the digestive tract. And it's usually due to an inability to properly break down that food protein, causing symptoms like bloating, stomach cramping, gas, and diarrhea. Food intolerance could be due to things like enzyme deficiencies or even sensitivity to food additives or reactions to naturally occurring chemicals in foods. And in contrast to food allergy, often people with food intolerance can eat small amounts of the food without causing problems. So again, food allergy in contrast to food intolerance does involve the immune system and can cause a serious or life-threatening reaction. So people can be allergic to any food really, but there's eight foods in the United States that cause the most food allergic reactions. And those include milk, egg, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. Now I put sesame on this slide because sesame is not right now, um, you know, it's not considered one of the top allergens um, by the FDA. However, studies have shown that it is quite common and perhaps the ninth most common um, allergen in the United States. And that's important to note. So here are some symptoms that you can have from an allergic reaction. And they really range from quite mild to severe. So you really have to be aware of any of them. Um, so oral cavity, like in your mouth, tongue, um, some, or throat, you can have itching or swelling of these parts of your body. On your skin, you can see just uh, mild flushing or itching all the way up to a really bad rash or hives, also known as welts all over your body. In your respiratory system, you can experience wheezing, shortness of breath or coughing, nausea, abdominal cramping, belly pain, vomiting, diarrhea are all um, in the GI tract. And then the most severe symptoms would involve the cardiovascular system where there's um, an increase in a heart rate or decrease in blood pressure, and then which leads to fainting. Anaphylaxis, so the, the definition of anaphylaxis is controversial and it's different in different literature that you might read, but really it means it's, it's a severe allergic reaction. It can happen quickly and it can cause death. Usually most evidence-based literature sources say that anaphylaxis includes more than one organ system. And it is very important to remember that not all reactions are the same. So you can still have a life-threatening reaction to your problem food, even if you've never had a serious reaction before. So past reactions do not predict future reactions. And I know this all sounds scary, but we have to look at the facts. Death from anaphylaxis is very infrequent. It's very rare. In one study over 10 year period, it was found that there were only 164 cases of food-induced anaphylactic death. Um, there are, so again, it's a rare occurrence. There are some risks um, that lead to death in anaphylaxis due to a food allergy, and these include underlying uncontrolled asthma, uh, delayed epinephrine use, which I would say is probably number one, symptom denial, so patients like especially teenagers that don't carry around their EpiPen, um, or a previous severe reaction. And usually the history of an anaphylactic fatal reaction is that it was a known food allergy, not a new food allergy or an unknown food allergy. So for young kids, how do we tell if they're having an allergic reaction? So some things a young kid might say, this food is too spicy, my tongue is hot, it feels like something's poking my tongue, my mouth is tingling, my tongue itches, my tongue feels like there's hair on it, my mouth feels funny, 
there's something stuck in my throat, my tongue feels full or heavy, my lips feel tight, it feels like there's bugs in my ears, my throat, my throat feels thick, it feels like there is a bump on the back of my tongue or the back of my throat, there's a frog in my throat, or my belly hurts. And these are just some examples of how a young child might describe a reaction. For nonverbal kids, things to look out for are itching, like scratching at the ears, um, rubbing of the nose, runny nose, um, rubbing of the mouth, or putting their fingers in their mouth after eating. All right, so I'm gonna talk about how to, now we know that, um, that your child has a food allergy and we know kind of what to look for. So now I'm gonna talk about how to manage it. So just a brief, slide on managing food allergies in the time of COVID. So know that allergists are there for you. So contact an allergist for a new suspected allergy or a follow-up of a known allergy that you've been dealing with for a little while. Telehealth and telemedicine are under widespread use now. I know my clinic's doing it. We're seeing tons of patients every day over telemedicine um, and treating a variety of conditions and really just talking through food allergies with a lot of food allergic families right now, getting their plans in place and making sure they know where to go and who to call if they do have a reaction. We can really manage a lot via a live visit over the internet. And even a new food allergy might not require urgent in-office testing. If the history is consistent with symptoms of a food allergic reaction, we might not need to bring you in right away. Um, and like I said before, reviewing food allergy action plans, which we'll go through soon. So managing food allergies. So these are kind of some of the things I'll, I'll touch on in the next uh, few slides. So when you're newly di diagnosed with a food allergy, strict dietary avoidance is gonna be very important. And um, later on in the talk, we'll, we'll talk about treatments and, and things that are becoming available, but strict dietary avoidance has been the mainstay of treatment for food allergy for quite some time. Having an anaphylaxis management plan, very important, and I'll go through an example of that in a few slides from now. Ready access to injectable epinephrine and knowing how to use it a plan to seek emergency care if needed, ongoing follow-up and education with your allergist, nutritional support can be quite important for patients, uh, kids with multiple food allergies, and then a comprehensive education plan for not only the patient, um, if they are verbal or if they can understand what's going on with their food allergy, but their family and their caretakers their, and their school and their daycare eventually. So let's get into avoidance of food. So this is what we're told, you know, avoid, avoid, avoid. That's the most important. So really it is important to read every label every single time. Even if you are fully, you know, aware of something that doesn't have an allergen, still read the label just to be safe and just to get in that habit. And then be aware of cross contact. So cross contact happens when one food comes into contact with another food and then their proteins mix together. So as a result, each food then contains a small amount of the other food. And this is, I know you all know this, but these amounts can be so small that they usually can't be seen. And even a tiny amount of food protein has, ca has caused reactions in people with food allergies. But the term cross contact is fairly new. You might've heard this as called cross contamination. So there's a difference between direct and indirect cross contact. Direct cross contact is when an allergen comes into direct contact with a food. Um, for example, peeling cheese off of a cheeseburger if you're dairy allergic or picking shrimp out of a salad if you're seafood allergic. Um, and then indirect cross contact is in, that the allergen was never directly applied. So like using a spatula to flip a cheeseburger or not properly cleaning a knife after um, cutting a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, for example. So using utensils, cutting boards, and pans that have been thoroughly washed with soap and water is really important. Um, in the home, consider using separate utensils and dishes for making and serving safe foods. Some families choose different colors to ident identify safe kitchen tools. Um, and it, obviously, if you're making several foods for several family members, cooking the allergy safe foods first and keeping the safe foods covered and away from other foods that may splatter. Washing hands with soap and water before touching anything else if you have handled a food allergen is very important. And it is interesting to note that soap and water or commercial cleaning wipes will remove a food allergen, but sanitizing gels or water alone will not remove a food allergen. 
So now going on to, um, you know, continuation of avoiding of foods, but going on to what is this FALCPA, FALCPA law? It um, stands for Food Allergy Labeling and Consumer Protection Act. So this is a law that requires food labels in the United States show in plain English when a major food allergen or any ingredient that contains protein from a major food allergen is added as an ingredient into any prepackaged food. So that's highlighted because that's important. It's in prepackaged foods. So this, is, this law applies to anything imported, which is sold in the United States, or domestic, which means it's made in the United States. So the foods that make the Falcfa list as of now are milk, wheat, egg, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, crustacean shellfish, and soy. So this includes the top eight minus the mollusk shellfish, which is interesting. It also, again, does not include sesame right now. So manufacturers have two options to indicate a major food allergen on product labels. The first option is to, as I, you see in example one, is to list the allergen in parentheses after the ingredient. The second option, as an example two, is to list the allergen at the end of the ingredient list. And often this will contain, will have a statement that says contains in bold. So the contained statement, interestingly, is only one of two options that they have, that manufacturers have for listing the presence of a major food allergen and is not required. So this is something we're used to doing when we look at labels in the grocery store. We, our eyes kind of naturally go to the end of the ingredients list to look for that contains label, but just remember that it could be embedded, the, the allergens could be embedded within the ingredient list and not within a contains label. So a manufacturer does not have to warn you that there may be unintentional traces of an allergen due to cross contact during processing, but most allergists recommend avoiding these products. So precautionary warnings or advisory statements like may contain or process in a facility with are surprisingly voluntary. Also, we have to note, remember that FALCBA, that law that we were talking about before, does not apply to fresh meats, fresh fruits and vegetables, restaurant foods, even the ones placed in a wrapper or carryout box for individual customer order. And this is the last and interesting one, Falcva does not apply to highly refined oils, even if they are derived from a major allergen such as peanut or tree nut. Whoops. This is because that um, because refined oil, like such as refined peanut oil, is generally considered safe for most peanut allergic or allergic persons. This is thought to be due to the fact that most, if not all, of the protein is removed during the extraction process. There have been studies into whether reactions occur in these peanut sensitized individuals with exposure to refined peanut oil versus crude peanut oil. Um, and those who participated in one study did not have a reaction to peanut oil, but 10% to the refined peanut oil, but 10% had a reaction to the crude peanut oil. And other studies have been conflicting with this, showing that a small number of peanut allergic individuals may have reactions to refined oils. And this could be due to cross contact or cross contamination with the actual peanut itself. So if you have any questions about this, or if your child is allergic to peanut or another um, you know, allergen that's in refined oils, talk to your allergist about this. Okay, so going on with managing your food allergies. So in the home, what can you do? So talking about siblings for a second, a survey was done in siblings of those kids with food allergies and revealed that food allergies are obviously a family disease and they impact each member of the family in different ways. Siblings were impacted with regards to allergen avoidance, exercise caution around the sibling, label checking and helping with epinephrine, worrying about the sibling, and sometimes receiving less attention because of the sibling with food allergy. So these are all things that we have to note in siblings. One easy way in the kitchen to help with uh, siblings with food allergies is use of color coding or labels. So having different colored utensils, different colored bowls, different colored plates, even different colored cooking um, utensils that we talked about earlier for the sibling that has the food allergy versus the other kids in the family. Obviously parents um, have to be educated, all parents in the home, and if their are parents um, in a different home, you know, everyone has to be educated. Grandparents and other caretakers, we often hear from families that grandparents don't um, quote unquote believe in food allergy and they might wanna feed the kid a food, even a small amount will be just fine, we hear. Um, that's, a, that's a common thought of grandparents. Um, so we really need to educate the people um, in our families. 
And then lastly, just to touch on breastfeeding in this slide. So if a mom is still breastfeeding and a child is allergic to a food, we really wanna to try to keep that food in the mom's diet. Um, there's such a small amount of protein that passes from the mom to the mom's milk that, um, that the child ingests. So you know, we often recommend continuing it in the mom's diet. Of course, there's always exceptions to this, um, but for the most part, this is what we recommend. Um, if the child has eczema or atopic dermatitis, um, severely enough that we're thinking about food restrictions, we might do a short trial period in the mom um, for, you know, for, to see if eczema improves, um, but then immediately, you know, put it back in the diet after a few weeks that, and, and if there's no improvements. So empowering your child outside the home. Um, identifying a safe food or snack is really important. So having something prepackaged that the child can carry with them um, in a backpack to friend's house, to school, things like that, um, or identifying it out, out at other people's houses or caretakers' homes, that they know what it looks like and they know the ingredients and that, it's not, that it is safe for them. Um, so dining out, surprisingly, studies have shown that most food allergic reactions happen within the home rather than at restaurants or in school. Um, and over half of the reactions that occur in restaurants occur when the allergy is not specifically reported to servers. So really it's your job as a mom or a dad or a caretaker to call that restaurant ahead of time, know that they have um, policies for food allergic individuals, tell your server about your food allergy, tell them twice, tell them three times if you have to, um, and make sure that there is no allergen when it comes to the table again when they put it down on the table. Dining out is possible with food allergy. Again, reading food labels and then educating schools, daycares. Also, um, having your child wear an emergency identification identification bracelet like the one shown here um, can be useful and I will give you the resource for that, uh, those bracelets at the end of the talk. All right, so here's that anaphylaxis or allergy action plan that I mentioned before. So this comes directly from the FAIR website. Um, we give this to every single uh, food allergic patient, no matter how mild or severe in our clinic. Um, each person with food allergies should review their personal anaphylaxis action plan with their own allergist at least annually. Preparation does equal confidence. Um, make copies of this action plan. It should go to every caretaker and um, school. Um, I, I also say keep it with your medication pack. So keep a copy with the medication pack and I'll talk about medication packs um, in the next slide. Oh, sorry, just to go through, right, just to go through the allergy action plan, it does have a lot of useful information for the person looking at it and, and taking care of the child with food allergy. So it has all their demographics at the top with their name, their date of birth and what they're allergic to and their weight. Um, here it goes through mild versus severe symptoms, so when to give epinephrine and when maybe you can just give something like Benadryl or Cetirizine. Um, and then here are the medications and the doses for that particular child for his or her weight. All right, so managing food allergies, how to treat or treating a reaction. So. We always talk about antihistamines versus epinephrine, and we'll get into this a little bit in the next slide too, but epinephrine really is the gold standard of treatment for food allergy. Um, maybe some mild reactions can be treated with antihistamines, maybe some mild few hives, maybe some itching, um, runny nose, but really epi is the gold standard. We always wanna have both on hand though, so an antihistamine and epi. I often tell my patients to have three labeled medication packs and um, depicted are some examples that you can get on the web and, and some other sources I'll tell you at the end of the talk. But I always, want, I always like to say three. So keep one for home in an easily accessible location. Um, one for on the go, so you can easily switch from bag to bag. So diaper bags, purses, backpacks, et cetera. And then obviously one that is going to stay at school or daycare or a caretaker's home. So again, epinephrine is the only medication that can reverse the symptoms of anaphylaxis. So I know in a prior slide, we talked about anaphylaxis involving maybe more than one organ system. The one exception to this, and I really, um, you know, I always say use epinephrine if you have generalized hives. That means hives all over the body. If there's hives just in one location, perhaps antihistamine will take care of it, but really generalized hives, you wanna be using epinephrine. Any difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, difficulty talking. Um, if the child vomits, I recommend epi or obviously passing out. 
Antihistamines will not help with a severe reaction. So for, for a severe reaction, we're acting quickly. We're giving epi and then we're calling 911. So I'm going to touch on if you really need to call 911 in a later slide, especially during the time of COVID. But this is kind of the, the original recommendation that if you're using epi, you're calling 911. The reason for that is if biphasic reactions can happen. A biphasic reaction is a reaction uh, that happens that happens after the initial one. So after the symptoms resolve, you can see a recurrence of symptoms maybe several hours later. And that's why observation in the emergency room is often recommended. But again, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later if this is absolutely necessary. So, you know, after epi, Again, calling 911 or not, COVID has obviously affected this. We don't want our children to be sitting or ourselves to be sitting in a, a you know, busy emergency rooms or even taking up beds in an observation area um, because of COVID. So this is this is you know I, I this is an individual approach. I really approach this differently with every family. And if a family is very comfortable with their food allergy, um, or they've you know had a sibling with food allergy, they've seen allergic reactions before, they've used epi, they know what to expect. Um, it might not be necessary to call nine one one or or, or go directly to the emergency room. And now in in this day and age with the telehealth video visits, this is absolutely amazing. Um, just last week, I saw a patient. Um, you know. We always tell our patients after they're stabilized to call our office and let us know if they've had a reaction. We want to document it, we want to put it in their notes, and we want to follow that over time. And then obviously talk to them over the phone and manage their fear and anxiety over, uh, over this reaction. So just last week we had a patient call in, just like we always tell them to do. She had stabilized after epinephrine. It was a young teenager, about 12 or 13 years old. Um, her mom felt pretty comfortable, but we said, hey, let's just set up a telehealth visit. It's so easy. It's so convenient. They were in their home. I was in my home. Um, they got sent the link and they were, you know, I saw them within five minutes of them calling into our office. And it was about an hour after she had used epinephrine. She was talking, she was uh, looking great, she had no difficulty breathing, and um, the hives that she had had as part of her allergic reaction were all gone. I could see that over video. Her mom showed me her back, her arms, everything, and she was feeling comfortable. So that kind of family and that kind of visit made me feel very comfortable that this patient did not have to go to the emergency room after using her epinephrine. Um, and also just to remember, you know, this, there's, there's a myth that might be floating around that epi is not effective uh, for an, another, like an, a, a subsequent reaction if we use it for one reaction, but that's just not true. Studies have shown again and again that epinephrine is just as effective for the next reaction. All right, so why are food allergies increasing? We're going to kind of shift our focus a little bit. So you know, there's so many reasons that allergies, food allergies in particular, increasing. Um, and peanut allergy has been one that's been all over the media that has definitely, we've seen an increase over time. So is it late introduction of certain foods? So this is a hypothesis that has um, now gained a lot of traction, especially with peanut after a large study um, looking at kids in the UK versus Israel, um, showing that kids in Israel actually are introduced to peanut protein at a very young age, between as young as four months, but most between four and six months of age, in the form of a peanut puff. So a peanut protein puff, um, also known as bamba. Um, and so these kids you know, are eating it on a regular basis. And then, you know, a couple of years later, studies have shown that these kids actually don't have food allergy or don't have peanut allergy. And, and so is it that late introduction of certain foods in the United States have led to an increase in, in allergy? Perhaps. Um, there's the hygiene hypothesis that just, you know, goes over, you know, all the cleaning that we do, um, keeping our children off of dirty floors, um, reducing the uh, daycare exposure or other children exposure at young ages. Um, this could have an impact on increasing food allergy. Now, the dual allergen exposure hypothesis is an interesting one. This is attributed to Gideon Lack um, that showed that it impaired in, in impaired skin barrier plays a role in sensitization as a first step towards food allergy. So this theory describes that exposure to food allergies through the skin can actually lead to allergy while eating the food at an early age may actually result in tolerance or no allergy. So depending on the balance of these exposures, that skin versus gut exposure, um, either tolerance or allergy will win. 
uh, quote unquote. So children with eczema, for example, have a disrupted skin barrier that could allow for food proteins in the environment, such as like peanut oil and creams or peanut residue on tables. Um, so they would get an allergy because they're not eating it as much. So if they avoid peanuts but are still exposed to them in the environment, they might be more likely to develop the peanut allergy. Um, is it our increased use of antibiotics, especially during the prenatal period or the, um, you know, in utero and postnatal period, an increased use of antacid medications that could potentially reduce the digestion of allergens in, that, in the gut? Um, is it because, again, going along with the hygiene hypothesis and increased use of antibacterial soaps and sanitizers that kind of get rid of all that good bacteria that we're supposed to have on our skin and we're supposed to have on our, in our gut? birth by cesarean section. This kind of goes along with the, the bacteria again that um, you know, vaginal births allow for more exposure to normal good microbiota or, or a microbiome. And then differences in our microbiomes could lead to differences in uh, rates of food allergy. So again, it's probably not one of these hypotheses, probably a combination of them. And we really, there's so much research going into all of this right now. We don't have an answer, but these are some thoughts. So again, going back to my initial slide that it's not your fault. So treatment options for food allergies. So now we've, you know, we've gone through a bit of management. You know, we, we, we tell patients to avoid, avoid, avoid. But now there are other options um, for food allergy management. Is there a cure? That's always a question we get. And the answer is no, not right now. However, we do have a lot of up and coming treatments that are being used both in the private practice world and in research centers all across the country and all across the world that are showing such promise. So OIT is an acronym for oral immunotherapy. Now we uh, at Schreiber Allergy where I work, we have a lot of experience with OIT. We have you know, over 150 patients that have gone through the program over the course of four years, but there are many private practices throughout the country and throughout the world that are prescribing this and it's, and it's working and it's successful. Not in all patients, but in many patients it is. Um, OIT is going on in research centers and really rigorous studies to determine which foods are the best for this um, desensitization procedure, um, how long patients have to be on it, et cetera. So Palforzia, which is a peanut product, is now approved by the FDA. So that was approved in January of this year. And that just gives us another option for oral immunotherapy for peanut. It's very similar to what private practices are already doing with oral immunotherapy, although um, Palforzia is just limited to peanut right now. So issues, you know, quality of life is always an issue. So if, if a family comes in and says, you know, we are perfectly happy avoiding the food and it's easy for us to avoid the food and we're fine with that, you know, we don't, we don't even go to talk about treatments or, or management strategies like OIT. Um, but for a lot of families, especially families who have seen severe reactions or they're scared to go to restaurants or they're scared to travel, this is um, a really good option. And then desensitization versus tolerance. So, you know, desensitization is equivalent to a reduced reactivity while receiving therapy. So right now, oral immunotherapy, you have to continue. So that it, it, it involves um, eating the food on a daily basis. And I'm not going to get into all the details of this because I know there was another webinar or another session on oral immunotherapy and other treatments, but just to give you an overview of kind of things that you could talk to your allergist about in the future. Um, and then there's other options coming, you know, in still in research phases is SLIT and EPIT. So SLIT stands for sublingual immunotherapy. Um, this has been used in several private practices. Um, and EPIT or epicutaneous or patch immunotherapy, um, that's in research phases, but uh, looking to be approved sooner rather than later. Um, and some private practices have been using these, these modalities as well. Monoclonal antibodies, for example, Zolaire, which is a, a an anti-IgE medicine that's used in asthma. That could be um, used for food allergy. And then combination therapy, like oral immunotherapy plus a monoclonal, like Zolaire, like Dupixin, or one of the others that's um, coming, coming down the pipeline. And then as you can see, there are lots of future treatment options for food allergy. So these are all either in clinical trials with potential for entering clinical practice or preclinical studies. And I've mentioned some of these already. Um, so just to, that's a, just to look over. All right, so questions. So can my child outgrow their food allergy? So this is a great question. And for cow's milk and egg, it does look very promising for a lot of kids. So cow's milk, 85% outgrow by eight years and egg, 66% outgrow by five years. 
So, you know, really keeping that um, communication with your physician, really keeping that relationship with your allergist is so important. They can follow you over time, track you, retest, um, perhaps perform an oral food challenge if there's a question at all, if, you're, if the child is outgrowing this, because the sooner we can get the food in them, the better. Um, peanut, only 20% may outgrow. And then tree nut and seafood allergies typically persist. So can we prevent food allergy? So if you're looking at, you know, younger siblings or future pregnancies, um, the, you know, there's not, again, just as in there's so much research going into what causes food allergy, there's so much research going into like how we can prevent food allergy. So there is some emerging evidence that suggests, you know, and going back to that hygiene hypothesis that less use of drying soaps and detergents um, and more use of non-allergic moisturizers can optimize the early life skin barrier. So going back, also going back to that dual allergen exposure hypothesis. Um, and then solid introductions, which we talked about late introduction of foods could potentially be um, kind of a cause or an, uh, an aggravator of um, increased food allergies, especially in this country. So infants should be introduced to solids around four to six months, irrespective of family history. So studies have shown that allergenic solids do not need to be avoided by infants when solids are introduced, and they do not need to be avoided by mothers when breastfeeding. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Obviously, if a child is very high risk, if they have severe eczema, or if they have a lot, like a sibling with food allergy, you talk to your allergist about this, and um, the child could be tested prior to introduction, especially to peanut. Um, just continuing on if we can prevent food allergy. So human milk contains a vast ar array of bioactive factors, including hormones and growth factors and neuropeptides and anti-inflammatory agents. Um, and it should be the first and most important source of nutrition for infants. And it does influence, you know, many physiologic systems, pr promotes that normal gut colonization. However, its role in protection against food allergy risk remains unclear. And there's plenty of formula feeding um, moms and, and formula fed infants that still have food that don't have food allergy and the op and breastfed infants that do so this is um, an area of much research. Um, there's some studies going on about prevention of food allergy with hypoallergenic formula for infants. Um, this is a premature recommendation. There's just not enough data there. Probiotics or prebiotics given to infants or even moms that are pregnant, there's just insufficient data. And then vitamin D as a prevention or treatment of food allergy is also being looked into, but right now there's insufficient evidence. Um, so again, talking about the younger siblings to test or not to test. Um, so there's a study done that evaluated the risk of food sensitization and allergy for siblings um, with food allergy. And this study, was small, but it evaluated, or not small, sorry, it evaluated over a thousand children with food allergy and at least one sibling. So this was interesting. It found that siblings were 66% of them. So two thirds of the siblings were food sensitized, meaning that they had positive tests, but only 13% of them were clinically reactive. So when they actually fed the child the food, they didn't have any problem at all. So this shows that siblings might have an increased rate of positive tests, but not being truly allergic. So we have to be aware of false positives and working with a, you know, a good allergist should, should, uh, you should get through this process. Um, oral food challenges, which we do on a regular basis should be routine if there's any question at all. So common questions that I get from my patients, and then obviously we're gonna open it up to questions to you guys at the end, um, but these are some common questions that I get from my patients all the time. So daycare and school, do I need to move my child to a nut-free environment? So this is you know, a question that obviously comes up for nut allergic kids and peanut allergic kids. You know, the, the, there's a lot of controversy over this subject because the school systems do it. They remove nuts, um, especially private schools. They're removing nuts in nut-free environments. You see that everywhere. However, the studies sh have shown that it really doesn't matter. Um, what matters the most is education. So really educating the school, the nurses, the teachers, um, whoever's going to be around your child, that's the most important thing. Um, there was more reactions in, a, in one of the studies, there was more reactions in nut-free schools than in non-nut-free schools. Because in the nut-free schools, they almost have um, a sense of, you know, 
they have a sense that things are going to be okay because there's no nuts, but that's just not true because children still could bring in nuts. They could, um, you know, they parents forget when they pack lunches, etc. So there were more reactions in nut-free schools than um, in non-nut-free schools. Perhaps having nut-free tables is a good idea, and there have been some studies looking at that as well. But really, it all comes down to education. Flying with food allergies. So, you know, this is obviously is an individual decision and um, talking to an allergist is very helpful, but flying ha is a, there's a very low risk of having a reaction to aerosol allergen in planes. And this is kind of a myth that's floated around that you can have a severe reaction if you just breathe in um, a powder or a dust of the allergen. And this is just not true. Um, due to the potential risk from the dust, like if a child, you know, touches it and then puts it in their mouth, obviously that's higher risk because you're ingesting it. So it is recommended to wipe the seats and the trays down on airline, on airplanes, um, but it shouldn't prevent you from flying if you're just educated and aware, even telling your flight attendants and, and maybe even the pilot. Um, this is a question often, can my child get a flu shot if he or she is, is allergic to eggs? And the answer is almost overwhelmingly yes. Um, you can do it in an allergist or pediatrician's office if there's question, but the, um, there's such little amount of egg protein and flu shots that this is not a problem. Um, biphasic reactions and do I really have to go to the hospital if I use my epi? I think we already touched on this. Um, lastly, the cross reactivity of allergen. So if my child is allergic to X, are they, do I have to avoid why? Um, and, you know, I'm just going to go to my next um, depiction because this really shows the if allergic to and then the risk of a reaction of at least one of these others. So I, the peanut legume question I get all the time and there's such a low risk of reaction. I don't say to avoid if they've never had a problem um, before, you know, peas, lentils, beans, etc. Um, tree nut and other tree nuts obviously is more, um, there's more of a risk of a cross reactivity. So with peanut allergic kids that have never had tree nuts before, you know, it's a decision that's made between the allergist and the family, but often we will, you know, perform skin testing prior to introduction and work through those, um, perhaps perform some oral food challenges in, this, in the office when the child is young to really determine true allergy or not. So some online great resources for patients, for, um, for the kids themselves, for the families, for the grandparents, for schools, um, obviously the Food Allergy Research and Education website, um, Kids with Food Allergy website, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology website, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology website. Allermates is um, one of the websites that I featured throughout the presentation with those food allergy bracelets and the medication cases. They also have activity books for younger kids. Um, Living Confidently with Food Allergy is a website that's nice. Um, the Nationwide Children's Hospital has an allergy and asthma blog that has lots of good information as well. And offline resources really, really rely on your allergist, your physician, um, and your educated support system. I put that in parentheses because without being educated, you really shouldn't be reading, you know, blogs and, and things that you don't know uh, where, where the information is coming from. Um, and then FAIR, you know, just a plug for their live events. They're great, like the walks and the conferences and the summits, you can get so much information out of a lot of physicians that are doing research in all these areas that I talked about are visiting these conferences and summits and have such good information that you can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and also, you know, I didn't mention going back to the American Academy of Allergy and Asthma and Immunology, the Quad AI, they have um, a member, um, they have a website, a, a link on their site to find a board certified allergist in your area if you still don't have one or if you, um, you know, are looking for a, a different opinion. And that is it. I'll open it up to questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sokol. That was, that was so informative and we did get some questions. So let's jump right in. Okay. So so we um, kind of the first question we got in the beginning of the presentation is from an attendee and she asks or she states that her baby had a skin prick test following a reaction to eggs, which came back positive for milk and tree nuts as well. She states, however, she's never actually eaten either of those foods. Can it be considered an actual allergy yet? Um, she's confused regarding a true diagnosis. Do you think she needs, you know, oral exposure before it's officially considered an allergy or perhaps a blood test 
if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, that's a great question. And I didn't go so much into diagnosis in this, um, in this talk, um, but great question. And obviously we deal with this on a daily basis in the clinic. So, you know, it, it comes down to the fact that we really don't want to do a lot of over testing for, for foods that have not been ingested yet or for foods that have not caused a reaction. However, when you show up to an allergist office and you're offered skin prick testing for a food that there's been a reaction to, often either the allergist or the patient or the parents or in conjunction with one another, we choose to move forward with further testing. It might be because of family history. It might be because the child has eczema. It might be because you're worried about a particular food. But in any event, this child in question, um, the parent asked, you know, they had skin testing for other foods. Now, I don't know what the skin tests look like. And, you know, it, this is, again, every patient is individualized and, and different. But, you know, I would look at the size of the skin test. I would also likely do some blood testing to get more information, just the most data I can get on these foods. Um, nowadays, we have component diagnostics, which kind of break down into different proteins, um, less severe and more severe allergies for some of these foods that she mentioned. Um, just the more data, the better. Um, but really like ingestion of the food and then watching for reaction is the most important part of the history. So if a child has never ingested the food and depending on the size of the skin prick test and depending on the, um, the level of the Ig in the blood, I would recommend an oral food challenge under the supervision of an allergist if it's favorable. You know, sometimes these levels and sometimes these numbers just come back so high that it's, you know, it's it's likely food allergy and it's just too dangerous to perform an oral food challenge. But for the most part, we can perform oral food challenges and kind of work through these because we want the child to be introduced to as many foods as possible early on. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is actually, we have Anne, who is a grandparent joining us. So we talked a lot about grandparents. So welcome, Anne. Thanks for joining us. Um, she had a quick question. As grandparents with a grandson with multiple food allergies, is there a specific form that the grandparents, um, you know, maybe should have the parents fill out in lieu that there is an allergic reaction, kind of like what steps they should follow, you know, for medical care? Well, I think going back to that fair anaphylaxis action plan is really important to have. If the parents kind of want to um, make it more user friendly or more grandparent friendly, they certainly can do that, you know, by copying and pasting into a Word document and kind of make it maybe making, um, you know, stepwise uh, how to treat this, what to look for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, just having a plan in place, having education, um, even bringing the grandparent into the allergist office. I mean, we've done that before. If, if the mom or the dad, uh, you know, wants that, if they're not communicating it well to the grandparent or the caretaker, we certainly have done that. So we can really go step by step and educate them. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, this next question, I think is great for those newly diagnosed and, and trying to wrap their heads around all of this. Um, one of our attendees asked, should everyone with a confirmed food allergy carry an epinephrine auto injector or only if they have had a serious reaction in the past? So my thought, and I think most allergists would say that even with a history of mild reactions, we want you to carry an epinephrine an auto injector. The reason is we can never predict a future reaction. We just can't. Um, a severe reaction can happen any, at any time. So yes, always. Wondering. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Up next, we have a mother asking, if eczema does improve after removing the baby's allergens from the mom's diet while breastfeeding, um, is it best for mom to avoid allergens until weaning? Yes. I mean, yes. So like I said, there's always exceptions to you know, most, right? There's never all or nothing in medicine. Um, and that's why medicine is so fascinating, right? So, you know, if, if, if a child's eczema is improving after removal of an allergen, I would have her continue removing that allergen from her diet until she weans. However, we just have to be careful of nutrition. So we want to make sure like we don't want a mom to remove a ton of allergens from her diet unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, so really removing, if the child even has like multiple allergies, we wanna remove one at a time to see if things improve. Um, because the child's nutrition, we don't wanna harm the, the child and what they're getting. So, yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
we have a question from attendee, and sometimes this comes up, um, and she wants to say first, thank you so much for this informative talk. And, and we are here talking a lot about kind of newly diagnosed in children. Um, but as a recently diagnosed adult, she was asking, is there anything different maybe that you would recommend for adult onset allergies that's different from, from children? And I, and I know you, you work with children so much as a pediatrician, but if there's anything different you can think of that you could share. No, I mean, I work with uh, adults with food allergy as well. Um, I would say, you know, it's a little bit different in the foods that they're allergic to. Um, in, in adults, we see more peanut, tree nut, shellfish, seafood, that kind of thing, just because those are persistent throughout life. Um, but, you know, carrying around information is important is helpful, I think, for adults even to have. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but carrying a little card with allergens, um, I feel like we've had a lot of patients who go out to restaurants or travel or on planes and things, and it, a food allergy isn't taken as seriously in adults as it is in children. Um, but that shouldn't be the case because obviously we know that food allergies persist over time um, and even can develop in adulthood. So maybe carrying a little card that um, has your allergist name and what foods you're allergic to. Um, we've done that for a few of our adult patients just so they're taken a little more seriously um, when they're out of the home. Great, thank you. Um, next question from an attendee is, how often do you recommend testing or retesting to see if the allergies have changed, perhaps, you know, before doing uh, food challenges? Sure. That's a great question. And again, it's going to be different for each patient um, and each food, right? So, and it's all, it's, it depends on the family's wishes also. Like, as I said earlier in the presentation, the family is quite happy and quite content with avoiding a food and they really have no interest in introducing it into the child's diet and the child they know their child is going to be very picky and not going to want to eat a food then of course i'm not going to torture the child with you know blood testing or skin testing um, if it's if it's not going to change my management however with foods that are really you know likely to be outgrown in childhood like egg and milk i want to follow those um you know on a regular basis so usually with young young kids i say every six months um, with older kids every year at least um, if we want to introduce a food via an oral food challenge i want a recent result so i'm not gonna um I i'm not gonna perform an oral food challenge if a child's had blood testing over a year ago. I'm just not. That that testing can change over time. It can worsen, you know, the allergy, the levels can go up. So we want to make sure that we're doing it safely. So we do want recent um, blood or skin testing prior to a food challenge. I hope that answers great. question. Great. Yeah, that's a great answer and, and good advice. Um, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about SPIs? Someone here was asking about it and, and maybe just kind of generally what that is. Sure. So FPIs, you know, th this talk really focused on what we call IgE mediated food allergies. And that's kind of that immediate, um, you know, histamine release, other mediator re release that causes all those symptoms that I went into. So FPIs is different. FPI stands for food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. And this is a food allergy that occurs in the gut of young infants. And it's a delayed reaction. So this is everything you know, throw out the window, everything we know about immediate food reactions. This is a delayed reaction um, and often seen in infants under the age of one, sometimes up to like three, four, five years old, but most patients will grow out of FPIs. So what happens in FPIs is a child will ingest a food and then within a few hours will start having profuse vomiting. Um, the vomiting can be so profuse and that they can, it can lead to deterioration and lethargy. Um, they can also have di present with diarrhea. Often these kids can be managed at home if you, you know, rehydrate them with water or Gatorade or Pedialyte. Um, but often the vomiting is so profuse that, or sometimes the vomiting is so profuse that they'll need to go to the emergency room to get, um, you know, IV hydration or medications to stop them from vomiting. The most common foods that um, cause an f reaction in children are usually milk, um, oat actually, uh, sometimes rice and wheat. Um, sometimes we see fruits and vegetables, but that's rarer. Um, and FPI is overall, you know, in the grand scheme of food allergy is a very uncommon um, diagnosis to have, but we do see it. And some patients can have concomitant IgE mediated or immediate food allergies and FPIs. We hope that answers the question. 
Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to jump around, um, but these, these <laughs> questions are great. So thank you so much attendees for, for asking. Um, just a quick question about just kind of treatments, I guess, maybe on the horizon. Is there, is there any idea amongst your community when the intranasal epinephrine um, may be available? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> yes, but I have heard about it. It's a great option. Um, you know, a lot of families are scared to inject epinephrine. A lot of teenagers are scared to inject epinephrine. So how wonderful would that be? Um, I think it is a true possibility. I don't think it's one of these things that might happen. I think it will happen. It's just a matter of when, and I don't have information about that. Okay, no problem. Thank you. We had a couple of questions come in about schools, and, and so I just want to ask this one, and, and also someone asked if I could really mention and encourage the, you know, the importance of parents, especially with the, those of a newly diagnosed child, to contact, you know, their school nurse and, and make them aware. Um, we have a nurse here in attendance. Um, she's a nurse in, in a kindergarten through grade two, grade second school. Um, and she was saying, you know, maybe like a best practice, how does she know when to administer Benadryl and watch and watch over the child or when to Im immediately administer, you know, the child's auto injector? You know, she says perhaps in a situation, the child, you know, was not in distress, but maybe showing just a little bit of hives or had a sore throat. Um, she says, obviously, she would go straight to the epinephrine auto injector for, you know, respiratory issues or difficulty breathing or severe symptoms, but, and perhaps it's a tough question to answer, but how do you know when, you know, Benadryl would maybe be the best first, first action or the epinephrine auto injector? Right. So, I mean, I, again, this, you know, it's an individualized um, approach. Um, I think every school district is going to be different. I know, you know, in the county where I work, um, schools are required to give epinephrine if the child has ingested the food and knows they ingested the food and goes to the school nurse, even if they don't have symptoms. So it's, I think it's, this, this um, answer is going to be individualized, but I think the FAIR form that I showed, the anaphylaxis action plan has a, has a pretty good approach to this. Um, also, I talked about, you know, using antihistamines for very mild reactions. And by mild, I mean a few hives, maybe on the face or on the hands or something. Um, uh, you know, some mild itching of the skin, mild runny nose. Um, but really, anything beyond that, it's better to be safe than sorry, especially in a school setting. Um, just giving the epinephrine and calling on your emergency services right away. Um, you know, there are there are families I know that have had like experience with this where their child has had accidental ingestions or they've you know, put something in their mouth and then immediately realized something was in their mouth and then spit it out. And then they end up at the nurse's office with nothing or with a mild hive. And if their family is like that, they can work with their school. They can work with the nurse, like, please give, you know, Benadryl and call me right away. Um, I think those are good options too. And just, again, it all goes back to education, 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 because each patient might be different. Right. I, I completely agree with that. And we'll also reiterate and say that, you know, FAIR's emergency care plan and action plan is such a great resource. And that's why it's so important that each student have one of those on file because it will outline, you know, exactly the steps that you should be taking in an emergency situation. So um, again, thank you for, for highlighting the importance of that. Um, I cannot believe we are almost at time, but I'm going to squeeze in one question that actually came in before before the event, and, and I know the person's here live with us today, and and he was asking, um, can you successfully wash off, you know, kind of quote unquote allergens from food, you know, that's potentially cross contaminated, perhaps after your trip to the grocery store, um, you know, is it possible to wash off that residue? Well, so like, so on a fruit or something like that, I think if the, if the food is easily washable, yes. Um, soap and water or commercial cleaning wipes. Um, again, not sanitizers, not water only, but if you're really scrubbing it, I mean, I think it depends on the food, right? Like if it's bread, that might not be so easy to wash off versus like a peel, you know, a fruit, like an apple or a mango or something. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I, okay, we are at time, so I am going to just kind of move to this next slide. If, if everyone can stay with me while I highlight our amazing FAIR patient registry. Um, I know these are extraordinary times of social distancing and canceled events, but we can 
each still actively support food allergy research through FAIR's patient registry. Um, it's all online and joining and completing surveys based on your yourself or your child's food allergy experience is super easy, it's quick, it's secure. And you know, sharing these stories, these individual unique stories with researchers will really make a difference. So I encourage you to check out the site and please join us at fairregistry.org. Um, so with that, another huge thank you to Dr. Sokol for joining us. I mean, it's so hard to know where to start, you know, as you know, and, you know, you provided such a solid foundation, so comprehensive, um, you know, uh, information that families maybe who just received that new diagnosis or, you know, maybe they're just coming back for a refresher or refresher wanted to check in. Um, this was so valuable. So thank you so much. And, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. Thank you.